Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, writers, scientists, educators, social scientists, activists, government and nonprofit leaders. We speak with each one to one. Few people are more invested in bettering our city than Mary McCormick. She's president of the Fund for the City of New York, a nonprofit organization that was established by the Ford Foundation 45 years ago with a mandate to improve the quality of life for New Yorkers. Her mission is clear, and her list of accomplishments and involvements is legendary. Welcome. Thank you. You're certainly the epitome of a civic leader. You've served on the City Charter Revision Commission, the New York City Youth Board. You were co-founder of the Food Bank for New York City, uh, served as board chair of Barge Music, and uh, are on too many other boards and commissions to count. What drew you into public service? Uh, I think people are born with a public service gene or an interest in improving things. So I think I couldn't have helped myself. It was inevitable. I go into a corporate world now, and I love the private sector and the corporate world, but I know I could never really have the career there that I wanted or the life. So it was not so much a matter of choice as just following my instincts. Was your first job out of college or graduate school in the public sector? Or? It was. When I graduated from Radcliffe, they were looking for teachers in the New York City public school system, and I wanted to teach in the worst school in New York City. And I found myself in a school in East New York, PS 63, that had the lowest, third lowest reading scores. And I thought I was so lucky that I had, I was really, had found it. Mm -hmm. And that experience that I taught there for two years really has shaped my entire professional career. What, you know, before we get to the fun, what would you say was your most rewarding uh, public service experience before you came to the fund? That's, uh, well, um, I would go back to the teaching experience because what that taught me in such a profound way was you have policies and policies are very hard to get enacted, but they mean nothing unless you have the resources behind them, right, and the training and the planning so they're translated into the reality on the front line. So in 1968-69 was a time of great uh, change, great changes in the school system. Ocean Hill Brownsville that Ocean, year? Ocean, we were on the edge of that, all these things, but that time and then I spent a few more years in education is that nothing hit the front line. So as much energy as we put up here, and when I, I've looked carefully all along now at education and I say, you know, how much can we congratulate ourselves on, on what has changed in the last 40 years? And I think we, there have been some clear successes, but I think we have to be rather quite modest about it. Mm -hmm. And I so appreciate learning that, you know, this first part of my career, because <coughs> I'm not sure I would have gotten, I would have understood that. So when and how was the fund created, and what does it do? Uh, the fund was created when the Ford Foundation built that magnificent building on uh, East 42nd Street. Uh, George McBundy was the president of Ford. John Lindsay was the mayor of the city of New York. Nonprofits don't have to pay taxes, real estate taxes. And out of a conversation uh, discussing that, they decided in lieu of taxes to create an organization that would seed innovation. Uh, in New York City with a focus on government and nonprofit organizations. Is, your, is the main focus of the fund on supporting, I know you support a lot of nonprofit organizations that are trying to address city issues. Uh, is it primarily, is your focus primarily on non nonprofits or do you also work with city agencies? I would say it's about evenly divided. Because if you look at city and the nonprofit in so many areas of social services and the things we care about, they're really one system. And so you've got to have both pieces of the system working well. You've got to have a well-managed uh, government with the right priorities, and then you have to have the nonprofit organizations with the capacity, right, to really deliver those services. So it depends on the issue, it depends on the time, it depends on the administration where we put our emphasis. Mm -hmm. But we have always worked with on both sectors evenly. 
Tell me about your incubator partner program. I'd love to tell you about that program. And you mentioned the Food Bank, and I was a co-founder of the Food Bank and a few other organizations. And in doing that, I realized that uh, people who have a vision and a mission and can create a program are probably not as highly skilled, nor should they be, in all the other aspects that you need for good management. So we created this program where if you had an idea and the possibility of funding, you could come to us and we would handle all management, financial, HR, and administrative aspects. So you could focus on the program, which you know, right. and the fundraising. And we have 70 some projects right now and they are phenomenal. What are some of the, tell me about some of them. Let me tell you about a couple of them. Dana Buckman, the fashion designer, um, very successful as you know, uh, had a daughter with learning disabilities. So she decided to leave the fashion industry uh, and create something that's called Promise Project. And she has <coughs> worked out a relationship with Columbia Presbyterian. They're working on getting low-income children, right, tested well, and then not just tested, but then put in the right schools. And they're doing it the right way because they're also raising money for research so that we not only have these children benefiting and one-off, but a kind of a thing that we can take nationwide, that here's the way to do it. You know, she had all sorts of resources and she could barely manage the system, right, for her own daughter. And her thought was, if I can't do this, right, and then it makes, as you know, all the difference in the world. Um, we have another new project called Spring Point Institute. So what we are all very excited about are, is the Common Core curriculum that is being implemented in the country. So it means for the first time we have educational standards, right, that you and I would support. And it's kind of been a grassroots from the governors right up. These are very tough standards. And unless we redesign schools, right, we're going to actually probably not get any success with them, you know, and the graduation rates will fall. So this program, which is supported by the Carnegie Foundation, really created by them, is doing a pilot in several cities around the country of getting the education leaders, teachers and others, to redesign the schools so that you can guarantee successful outcomes uh, with the Common Core Standards. Hugely important. And what do you do for them? What we do for them is that we make it a possible for them to just think about their work <laughs> and raising the money. So they become our employees, we do the health insurance, we do the, uh, we do the regular insurance, we do the audits, we do all the financial reporting, we do the lobbying reports, the really 1,000 things, right, right, that have to be done and done at a very high level of quality so that they don't have to even know about it. Do you provide this support indefinitely or is it for a finite period of time or? We, uh, we not smart enough to create a finite period of time. And so if it's working, it's working. The Center on Court Innovation, which is the leading organization really in the world on getting problem solving courts. And they won the Peter Drucker Prize as the best nonprofit in the United States in uh, 2009. We created that with the uh, Office of Court Administration long ago and there's still a project it's 20 some years now so as, as long as it's working it's very sophisticated and i think the harvard business review will discover this model in about 10 more years but right so you know we will support them wherever they want to be once we take you on we're we're there so what, what are some of the things that the it's, it's the project for court innovation is that the correct title it's the center for court the innovation. center for court innovation right. what are the, some of the things that it has done to improve the city courts? So this is what it's done, uh, and it's huge. The first part was the Midtown Community Court, where you had a lot of low-level activity, right? And what happened in the system at that time is nothing happened. So if you were arrested for drunkenness or prostitution, right, you might go down to the courts, you might not, you might show up. And so it's really about changing that pathway because most people who enter the criminal justice system with education, with support, would not, right? Any one of us could be there. So then the Midtown Community Court, if you did something, something happened. And what happened was you were given community service and you were also given courses and support and, and lunch, 
right? And you were drug tested, and we had a very sophisticated use of computers. So when you went back before the judge, the judge would know that you came to training, right? You did this, you did that, and you'd been drug free. Mm -hmm. the, it was expanded then to Red Hook, into the Red Hook Community Court, because this one was low level uh, crimes in Times Square, and broadened it. And it has transformed that community. There's a youth court, and you have a judge there, right? who then takes in the community, the family, it is not this piecemeal turnstile uh, type of justice. Right. So it's really quite exciting. There are projects uh, that they, we support around the United States, and there's a new project in London where they're trying to adapt this. You also provide bridge loans mm -hmm. for nonprofits that are waiting for committed funding, right? right? And, and including, I mean, there are some, some programs that are waiting for their funding to respond to Sandy, Hurricane Sandy. Right. There are two parts of that program. Okay. And this year we'll probably lend about $90 million. And while we charge a modest service fee, we do not charge interest. Uh, we work very hard to turn it around in just a couple of days. Because if, you, if your contracts are not being paid and you're a nonprofit, it's not your fault, right? You don't have money to pay interest and rest. You need to keep your organization going. And so what we work to do is to just keep that seamless so you don't miss a payroll that those things don't happen. And um, in, uh, right after um, Sandy, working very closely, really under the leadership of the Mayor's Fund to Advance New York City, together we created a $24 million loan special recovery loan program. And have I learned a lot from that. And what I've learned, we and the Mayor's Fund took its contribution and made it grants, so we have a grant loan program. But most nonprofits that said that suffered structural damage, FEMA, right, which is the group that we as a country have established, they are still yet getting to those groups. So six months after, right, they still don't know what FEMA is going to do. So this is basically for the nonprofits that this, suffered damage. From this is for the nonprofits, the senior centers, the housing for disabled, the soup kitchens, I all see. of those, right? I where they where those services, as we know after Sandy, were the most critical, right? In Far Rockaway, right? Right, and in Coney Island, right. and the situation is now that FEMA says, and I don't argue with that because that's who we are. But we say you have to settle your private insurance first. You then have to go to the um, Small Business Administration in Washington and apply for a loan and be turned down. And after that point, we will come and determine what we'll do. Right. And if it's on reconstruction, right, and most of these things are, you have to actually do the reconstruction and they will pay you after it's I done. See. I so see. So you can see how having the money up right. front makes all the difference. Right. And we think we probably won't be repaid uh, on these loans until 2015, perhaps mm -hmm. 16. Mm -hmm. We've met nonprofits that have not gotten their money from Hurricane Irene, which happened in August of 2011. Wow. So there again is the example. Here's the policy, yeah. right? It's good, it's what we want, but how, how well do we implement it? Yeah. We're going to take a short break, then we'll be back with more with Mary McCormick, President of the Fund for the City of New York, after this message. Did you know CUNY leads the way for students with disabilities? CUNY leads means linking employment, academics, and disability services. If you're a CUNY student with a visible or invisible disability, the City University of New York offers eligible students free career development and placement services. To find out if you qualify, visit cuny.edu slash CUNY leads. CUNY leads to the career I always wanted. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy at the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Mary McCormick, President of the Fund for the City of New York. You also have a Center on Government Performance. Is this the program through which you have your greatest amount of interaction with public agencies and public officials? It actually is not. It is not, okay. <laughs> this was a center where we wanted to include the perspective of citizens in governments now into measuring how well they do, right. right? Very important. If you can't measure, you can't manage. But you have to measure the right things. And so the center is an effort to involve citizen perspective in those measurements. 
And we started because... Sort of how am I doing kind of thing. But how are you really doing? Okay. Because okay. we created Sanitation Scorecard long ago at the fund, and that was a measure of the cleanliness of the city streets. So in the 90s, those measurements are very good, and they're incorporated in government, right? And they say the city is clean. And from that measure, it is. But from the measure of the citizen, it is not. And there was a period where it was absolutely no, I wouldn't say, very unclean, right? And so how do you get government to look beyond, right, one little measure to take in how people experience government? How do you? Well, by, uh, first of all, understanding how people experience government. And we do not think, oh, well, this is the, this belongs to the uh, fire department. This is a sanitation problem. This is a postal problem. Whatever we observe, right, in our neighborhoods, that comes to us and we form an opinion about how well government's doing. And so government has to be coherent. And what we came up with was a special handheld computer early on that let citizens, residents, right, go out into the community and on a block face mark everything, time and date stamped, right, of what was wrong. And then we could do a web-based um, applications, so you just put it in the cradle, right? These maps that would tell you as a city manager, or you as a parks person, you as a district, all the problems right on the street, all the ones that were sanitation, all the ones that were transportation, and then with that form of intelligence, it's a new form of intelligence, you as a city can respond more uh, effectively. I'll give you a very simple example. In one, the, one of the first neighborhoods we did, we, and we did this, when we do it comprehensively, so it's everything, right, when it's done, there were many empty tree pits. This is where the tree was missing. So if you called that into the Parks Department, what could they do, right? They may or may not, but if you said to the Parks Department, in this district, you have 50 empty tree pits, then the Parks is saying, okay, I can get those resources together and fix it. Okay. Um, so that's what that, and then we worked uh, with uh, cities around the, the country to get other cities and really have started a movement where s government officials are thinking actively of ways of incorporating citizens. So are you doing this kind of neighborhoods, are you doing it now, is it that continuing? It continues uh, in response to neighborhoods, but we're kind of on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and we're exploring where else to take it. Often when we develop these things, so they're then adapted by the private sector or by other people. Yeah, out of that project came, um, the citizens were very upset. Here are the three things was, who, who do they talk to first, right? Who answers the phone, right? The, the environmental conditions that they see, and then the smoothness of the city streets. Not potholes, but the smoothness. And so we thought, well, this will be a piece of cake. We'll work with the taxi industry, UPS, well, you know, and we'll have that. Turns out it had never been done anywhere in the world except for runways, because that's very important, and, you know, long uh, throughways. So we spent a couple years in adapting a laser methodology that you could put on a car and measure the smoothness. That was very innovative for the time. You know, it's huge because it means if you are a community board and a uh, Time Warner's digging up your street, and then Con Ed's digging up your street. You now have a way. They're supposed to, you know, repair right. the standard. Well, now you have a standard. It turns out now that there are a couple of private companies that are doing this. So, again, we kind of seed the innovation mm -hmm. uh, and go on to do something else. Right. Where do you have your most interaction with the public sector? How does that... In every one of our programs. Okay. Because you can't do anything, right, without having the public sector involved in it. We've got a city with $70 billion budget, right? Uh, and they are, you know, they influence everything. So if you want to change, you want to improve, you've got to bring them in as partners and either work with them kind of behind the scenes or, you know, have them working better with the nonprofit sector or help the nonprofit sector so they can engage better with government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's not a program that we, d we have that doesn't do that. The Sloan Public Service Awards uh, certainly seem to be a bright spot, a bright spot in a sometimes dim pic picture of how government is working. Tell us about that program. 
first of all, government's working very well. Okay. <laughs> I stand corrected. No, 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 but no, no, but the perception is, and this is why we have this program, the oldest program of the fund, because public service employees get a very bad wrap, right? We focus on what doesn't work and the one out of 100,000 who does something else. So just Wednesday, uh, we celebrated this year's six winners, and I'd like to tell you something about them. The first is a, a building custodian, but he and he started with when he was 19. He's been in the system now for 16 years. He's in charge of 30 buildings that have 50 schools in them on the west side of Manhattan. Those schools are all clean, the heat is all on, they're spotless, but in addition to that, he has been a pioneer in getting solar energy. On the roofs of the building, they've cut the energy use of several of the schools I think by 17%, and he's worked with the parents to create a composting program that's now going to be in 50 schools. I mean, this, and this is exceptional, but not that exceptional. We honored a woman who's head of nursing at Kohler Goldwater, and that is, you know, a, a safety net facility. You have 200 patients. On Randall's Island? On, on Roosevelt, Roosevelt Island. Roosevelt Island. You know, 200 patients on <laughs> ventilators. Lots of people who come in young because of gunshot wounds who are quadriplegics. Or, or they're there for 10, 15 years, maybe their entire lives. This woman started as a, a nurse's aide, right? 45 years later, she's director of nursing. She's educated herself. She ha that place not only has the highest quality of care, but she's also made sure that the individuals in it have the best life possible and is beloved. We honored an I a librarian in the Mott Haven section of the Bronx. Very few resources. This past year, there were 999 programs in this library that she brought in because they don't exist in the community. Uh, education, ESL, HIV, AIDS, testing. And then there are several homeless shelters where they're not allowed to recharge their phones. So when she learned that, she just got the strips, right? So you can do that. Or a woman, Cheryl Hodge, started as a traffic enforcement agent. I don't know, I see them, right? I couldn't do that. I don't think many of us could do that. She is a genius at it. She's been doing it now for 27 years and she's in charge of six commands. She's in charge of all the traffic in Manhattan and all the traffic in the Bronx and then all the special commands in the whole city. And if something happens, she has 3,000 people under her. And she's a civilian in the police department, but everyone respects her. And she actually, from 20th Street, could figure out what to do at 125th Street. She is so profoundly knowledgeable, a real leader. You know, and her, and everyone, you know, traffic enforcement agencies, agents, someone said to me, nobody likes us. But that Cheryl is able to inspire us and remind us why what we do is so important. And then a guy, uh, Phil Gleason, worked an engineer by training, worked in the private sector, could be making three times the amount of money, and he's in charge of landfill. So we have fresh kills, very complicated engineering, regulatory, whatever, and you have to close from the past what was the existence into the future. I see where, and then a woman who does make sure the, the bills are paid for nonprofits within the Department of Youth and Community Development. You know, 170 years of experience in those six people. And it's not just one day, it's day after day after day. Mm -hmm. And they all could have retired. And how do you find them? I mean, these are regular civil servants. These doing are regular, regular jobs. civil servants. And I remember I was n noticing last year you honored a bus driver who had been driving for yes. 22 years. Right, out of East New York Depot. And how do you hear about these people? Where do they, do they get nominated by? They get nominated by citizens, by their colleagues, by supervisors. But how, what's different about this program, if someone were to nominate you, we would check it out so carefully, they'd say, Cheryl is really good, but the person you ought to look at is so-and-so. Okay. Because we're looking for people who are the representative of the best. And they get, uh, is it a $10,000 stipend? $10,000 award. That's great, because a, a plaque is nice, but money talks. <laughs> and and mo money is a real and award. And money talks everywhere, <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> so, now we're, we're a city that benefits so much. You, we've got about a, a minute left. Tell me what do you, what, where you draw inspiration from in your work. I draw in, inspiration from the people I work with and the people I encounter. And I have the best job in New York, and one of the reasons is I meet people literally every day that I've never met before, 
maybe never even heard of or heard of their programs who are doing amazing things and have done those amazing things for the last 10 or 20 years. And so it, it's a way that keeps you both humble and inspired. And then what a pleasure to work for people where, with people where you share this set of shared values and that money is not, doesn't interfere as one of them to a very large degree. So it doesn't get better than that. Okay. We're out of time, but I want to thank Mary McCormick, President of the Fund for the City of New York, for joining us today. For more information about the organization, you can go to their website, fcny.org. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. If there are any people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at CUNY.TV and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.